I am David Feldman, and this is the mop-up. Former Dodger baseball all-star Steve Garvey is seriously considering a run to replace California Senator Dianne Feinstein in next year's election. Garvey would run as a Republican, since he has never held elective office before, is famous and a complete idiot. I have video of Joe Biden falling while handing out diplomas at the U.S. Air Force Academy. He falls flat on his ass, but I'm not going to show you the video because it's not funny to see President Joe Biden falling on his ass. I'll tell you why it's not funny, because it's not video of Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis falling on their ass. That's why it's not funny. It's not funny to see Joe Biden fall. So I'm not going to show the video. Hunter Biden's lawyers are now suing the Delaware computer repairman who turned Hunter's laptop over to Rudy Giuliani and then the New York Post. Lawyers for Biden, for Hunter Biden, say while the owner was allowed under Delaware law to keep the laptop's hardware after it went unclaimed for 30 days, The owner of the shop had no right to the software, especially the contents inside the laptop, which were then turned over to Rudy Giuliani and the New York Post. This is something I've been saying for months. Tens of thousands of members of the LGBTQ community are descending on Florida's Disney World to celebrate Gay Pride Month, despite the LGBTQ travel advisory that went into effect in May, warning Florida is no longer safe for their community. 150,000 tourists are expected. 140, 150,000 LGBTQ tourists are expected to show up at Disney World. Disney World's gay days began back in 1991. So wear a red shirt and meet in front of Cinderella's castle for the parade. With the federal government running out of cash on Monday, Senate Majority Leader Democrat Chuck Schumer fast-tracked passage of the debt ceiling bill late Thursday night. It passed by a vote of 63 to 36. Wednesday, in the Republican-controlled House, it passed 314 to 117. It will now head over to Joe Biden's desk, where he is expected to sign it. This weekend, this bill raises the debt ceiling until January of 2025 with no cap on how high the debt can go. Military spending will increase next year, but Joe Biden's proposed budget for next year already included an increase in military spending. The new bill would also increase spending on health care for veterans, something Joe Biden was asking for in his budget. Republicans essentially succeeded only in making it a little easier to fast track the permits on energy pipelines, and they succeeded in raising the age for work requirements to receive food stamps. Now, before the bill goes into law, anyone between the age of 18 and 49 who doesn't have a child living with them, well you're required to get a job in order to qualify for for food stamps. Otherwise, what? You starve? Turn to crime? We're talking about $6 a day worth of food stamps. Trillions on weapons, no questions asked. But God forbid somebody gets $6 a day to feed themselves without taking a soul-crushing job. Well, that's the way it was before this new bill goes into effect. Once Biden signs it, the new bill raises the work requirement for food stamps all the way up to 54. The homeless and veterans are exempted from the work requirement for food stamps. And here's where it gets sick and insane. After all the sadism, all the cruelty, all the bullying and fear, somehow, somehow, this new bill will add not subtract, it will add 78,000 more people to the food stamp rolls. Gets even worse. 
After all this cracking down on so-called food stamp fraud, 78,000 more Americans will be receiving them, while at the same time, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, says 275,000 Americans will live in fear that they might lose their food stamps. So we're going to terrorize 275,000 Americans into believing they're at risk of losing their food stamps while increasing the number of people on food stamps by 78,000. All this to lower the debt? I don't think so. I think it's to terrorize the American people. It seems ridiculous, doesn't it? Seems cruel and unnecessary. They make it harder to get food stamps. They terrorize an additional 275,000 Americans who are going to think they're not eligible for food stamps while adding 78,000 more people to the food stamp rolls. Republicans, they didn't succeed on this bill at all. They, they didn't succeed in gutting Medicare, which they wanted to do. They didn't get rid of Medicaid or Social Security. They only succeeded in making people work to prevent starving to death, but more people are going to be on food stamps, but more people are going to be terrified that they're going to lose their food stamps. This is just abject cruelty. That's all it is. And it doesn't lower our debt. Here's an idea when it comes to food stamps. Because this is the big victory that Kevin McCarthy got, right? You have to work for your food stamps. Here's an idea. Uh, we're the wealthiest country in the history of civilization. How about this? Nobody should be hungry. How about that as a baseline? No American should be hungry. Food should be free. And that's not socialism. That's common sense basic human decency, and good for business. Every community center in America should provide federally subsidized meals 24 hours a day to anyone who wants it, rich or poor. Nobody should be hungry in America. There should be food trucks stationed all over this country where people can get served a warm meal for free. It won't put restaurants out of business. It will feed the people who work in our restaurants. It will feed the people who deliver our meals for Grubhub because they are all paid starvation wages. So it will help the food business. It will be a subsidy for the restaurant business. Food, basic food should be free. Not all types of food, just healthy, bland, boring food. Make nutritious and boring food free to anyone, billionaires or homeless children. No means testing. I don't care if a billionaire never buys a meal and instead decides to eat for free from one of the government trucks for the rest of his life. Knock yourself out because I'm talking about the basics, beans, rice, water, soup, fruit, vegetables, and grain. Boring, but nutritious. Dull, but it will keep you alive. Nothing deep fried, nothing fattening or filled with sugar. The basics. Healthy, nutritious, boring food, no strings attached. For a country that claims to be Christian, I think this is what Jesus would say. Open some public kitchens. Open public kitchens in every community so people can gather and cook for themselves and others. You know, like a food library. The government provides the pots, pans, the utensils, the tables, the plates. The government could create good paying jobs for people to clean these public kitchens and work the pantry to distribute free grains and beans and seasoning. And people, ordinary citizens, like a library, could come in and cook for themselves and share what they cook with others, whether you're rich or you're poor. 
Bring your own ingredients. If you think the food pantry is dull and drab, bring your own ingredients. And you hang out, talk. Maybe there's a musician who annoys everybody by playing music and maybe even pay them. You know, there's something that the WPA did when Roosevelt was president, maybe pay an annoying musician to strum on the guitar while you're eating and talking. Uh, put a microphone and a little stage there uh, for storytelling or civic engagement. Civilizations. You want to talk about food stamps? Because this is all the Republicans accomplished. They terrorized Americans on food. You want to talk about civilization? Civilization starts around the fire, preparing the food, eating the food, digesting the food, talking about the food. It's how you build community through food, through food. And the Republicans are terrorizing this country by trying to get rid of food stamps. What they're trying to do is destroy our community. And we need to come up with ideas that are better than destroying the community. Our ideas should be building up the community with free food. Get people to eat together. Give the community, every community in America, the wealthiest country in the history of civilization, every community in America deserves a clean space to gather and talk and organize and take care of one another we can afford this. And once people get used to being around one another, we can organize. We can organize. We can organize free daycare that's subsidized by the federal government. Wouldn't that be great? How could you not want that for your neighbor? Community centers already exist. They're supposed to grow and flourish. Don't you want community centers subsidized by taxpayers where rich people and poor people can gather to cook or be fed for free, to hang out for free, talk for free, listen to some music for free, get some free Wi-Fi, listen to a lecture, a sermon, or sit quietly and read and know that you are not alone. Older people, could help younger people with their homework, or everybody could just play checkers. Single moms could drop their children off while they go to work. Community centers. We already have community centers in every city. It's where I vote. Give them more money. Build on them. New York City is dying. It's dying. The retail stores aren't coming back. We need community centers that are subsidized by the federal government. This town is dead because it's owned by landlords. Other countries do this. Other countries see the importance of making sure everyone is fed, clothed, and taken care of. It doesn't make you weak. Stop listening to Republicans who tell you these things make you weak. It makes you, what are you, an effing moron to think? Who raised you to think it would make, your parents should be brought up on charges of child neglect for you to think that free food makes you weak. Would you raise a child by denying them the basics? Would you, would you deny your child the basics, trying to convince them that by denying them food, and uh, security makes them stronger. It doesn't make you stronger. It makes you a, a demented, damaged Republican. Why would you do that to your neighbor's kids? Why would you want your neighbor's child to be frightened? Why would you want your neighbor to be frightened? It doesn't help anybody. It just hurts them. The American people have been brainwashed by the sickest of the sick, into believing that handouts make people weak. Handouts, think about this for a second. How could that make any sense? Government handouts make people stronger. Food 
Free food makes you stronger. Being hungry makes you weaker, makes you, makes you difficult to concentrate in school or at work. Free health care, what makes you stronger? You Free education makes you smarter and stronger. It's good for capitalism, you morons. All these things make everybody strong enough and ambitious enough to go look for a job or create businesses. And it provides the support we all need, capitalism needs, to keep these businesses going. But there's a pathology in the Republican Party. They are terrified, Republicans are terrified, that the American people won't be terrified. Republicans want us scared. They want us terrified that we won't be able to feed ourselves or our loved ones. They want us constantly afraid that we're one paycheck away from being homeless. And why is that? Well, they're sick. They're demented. They're hateful. They're satanic. They want to hear, because they're sexually dysfunctional, they want to hear, yes, sir, and thank you, sir, they want power over other individuals. They, they think it's to increase their profit margins. They've been told that. But it doesn't improve profits. If anything, hungry and frightened workers are bad for business. What job have you ever had where people were hungry and frightened and the company thrived? Where, where did we get this idea? The stupidity. But the Republicans want us terrified and off balance. Am I going to lose my food stamps? Am I going to be evicted? I don't know. Why? Why do they want us this way? Because it satisfies their sadistic impulses because they were damaged as children. And it makes them feel strong when someone else is weak. That's how the Republican mind works. I feel strong when someone else is weak because they can't maintain an erection. They don't read. They're not smart. They don't know how to love anybody. The only power they have is in taking the power away from somebody else. They convince themselves, I love this, that fear is the great motivator. Have you heard that one? They think fear makes people work hard. Anyone who thinks fear is what makes people work hard and succeed, anyone who thinks that is a failure. If you think fear, if you think fear is what makes people work hard, you're a failure. You think LeBron James lands the three-point shots because he's scared? You think he lands those shots because he's hungry? Fear and hunger hamper success. You have to be stupid to believe that fear and hunger is a great motivator. And that's why Republicans are stupid. Kevin McCarthy is stupid. He thinks fear will convince workers to shut up and obey orders and take whatever the boss is willing to give them. The Republicans aren't happy so they don't want the rest of us happy. They like the idea of kicking Americans off food stamps. That's how they get votes. Kicking people off food stamps, it doesn't lower the debt. It doesn't. It's $6 a day. It's like one bomb. Kicking people off food stamps doesn't save money. It doesn't lower the debt. And it doesn't make people work. They tried it in Arkansas. They tried it in Iowa. It doesn't make people look for jobs. You know what it does? Makes them hungry, sad, lonely, and depressed. And that's what Republicans want. They want children to work. That's what they want. They're for anything that hurts people. And they pretend it's about driving down wages. And some Republicans actually believe that because Republicans are economically illiterate. That's why they're Republicans. 
If you took Economics 101, you wouldn't vote for a Republican. And it's not just the low information Republican voter. It's the rich Republicans who are also economically illiterate. They're economically illiterate and rich because they either inherited the money they have or they're white and heterosexual and male. And it's easy for them to land a bullshit job that pays six figures. So, yes, they might have jobs. These economic illiterates who vote Republican, they have jobs as bankers. They work in economics. They work as bankers or hedge. They work in hedge funds or they work in insurance companies. But they're still economically illiterate. In fact, 99 percent of the people who work on Wall Street are economic illiterates because they have been brainwashed into thinking higher wages are a drain on the economy. You stupid effing morons. Higher wages juice the economy. Get that through your thick skulls, you morons. Higher wages juice the economy. Pay attention. I know it's hard for Republicans to pay attention. Listen to me. Two thirds of America's GDP is what you and I purchase. Two thirds of the GDP is what you and I buy. So if you're earning the current minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, how much are you going to be able to purchase? Nothing. Which is why the last time America's GDP was above 4% was back in 2000. Two thirds of our GDP is our purchasing power, you effing morons. If you drive down wages like the Republicans have succeeded in doing, these effing sadists have not r- allowed the minimum wage to get raised until uh, 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 since uh, 2009. When you don't raise the minimum wage, inflation catches up with it. And now Americans who are earning the minimum wage are earning in real dollars what they made in 1949. Uh, If you drive down wages, people stop buying things. And that keeps GDP growth down to a measly 2% a year. So yeah, we're not having, we don't have a recession, but we don't have growth. We haven't had growth since Bill Clinton was president. Our economy has not grown at a healthy clip, you know, at 4% or 5% since the 90s. Why? Because Americans have no money to spend. You effing economic, illiterate, sadistic morons. Two thirds of the GDP, GDP is what you and I buy. If wages stagnate, you can't buy anything. That's why our GDP hovers at around 2%. But somehow, Americans have been brainwashed into thinking that higher wages cut into profits and cause inflation. Higher wages increase profits, right? You pay your... Henry Ford knew this. Henry Ford famously said, I give my workers a raise because they have more money to spend and it comes back to me. And Henry Ford was a despicable anti-Semite. But even he knew this. Higher wages have nothing to do with inflation. Now, the Biden inflation, we were told and lied to about, we were told it was first caused by supply chain issues, coupled with a shortage of employees who don't want to work because of government handouts. It was a lie when they said it. And now the information is coming in and in inflation, the Biden inflation that we're dealing with, it's what I said it was. It's caused by greed. I said this last year. Check, check the company earnings. If people knew how to read a spreadsheet and look at company earnings, they could tell 
that inflation is caused by greed. And now the New York Times, this is from today's New York Times, Thursday's New York Times headline, companies push prices higher, protecting profits, but adding to inflation. Corporate profits have been bolstered by higher prices, even as some of the costs of doing business have fallen in recent months. So pay attention to this. Send it to your idiot Republican friends, because this is the truth about inflation. Okay, let me go full screen here. This is from today's New York Times. I'm sorry, it's published May 30th uh, in the New York Times. The prices of oil, transportation, food ingredients, and other raw materials have fallen in recent months as the shock stemming from the pandemic and the war in Ukraine have faded. Yet many big businesses, big businesses have continued raising prices at a rapid clip. Get it? Okay. The story goes on. For much of the past two years, most companies, quote, had a perfectly good excuse to go ahead and raise prices, said Samuel Rines, an economist and the managing director of Corbu, a research firm that serves hedge funds and other investors. Samuel Rines goes on to say, quote, everybody knew that the war in Ukraine was inflationary, that grain prices were going up, blah, blah, blah. That's what he said, blah, blah, blah. And they just took advantage of that. He goes on to say, but those go-to rationales, rationales for elevating prices are now receding. It was all bullshit. Okay, we're now learning what I told you a year ago, that inflation is caused by greed. Reporting in the New York Times shows that corporations are no longer dealing with supply chain issues. They never really were. But they kept raising prices. Why? Because they can. Because we were all told there's supply chain issues and that there's a war in Ukraine. And as that economist said, blah, 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 blah. If people believe inflation is real, raise prices. And the, they increased prices. It's not due to corporations passing their increased costs on to customers. That's what they want you to believe. Check the profit margins every quarter. These companies report their earnings. There are no new increased costs, just increased profits. Inflation, inflation that we're going through right now is because corporations are raising prices. They are charging more, not because their labor costs have gone up or the costs of materials have gone up. They are raising prices because raising prices increase profits and they can get away with it because most Americans are economic illiterates who believe what the loudest voices say about inflation. Now, there are several ways to solve the inflation problem. One is to do what we're doing right now, and that's to have the Fed just keep raising interest rates make the cost of borrowing so prohibitively expensive, economic growth sputters, and we go into a recession, if not a depression, and the demand for goods, well, that goes down, so corporations are forced to lower their prices. That's the Fed's plan, <laughs> to destroy the economy, to bring inflation down. Seems awfully cruel to create a recession to throw all those people out of work just to bring down prices. And by the way, corporations, yes, they have begun to lay people off, but they're just replacing them with cheaper workers. If you look at what's going on in big tech, yeah, they're big layoffs. They're just bringing in men and women from India who work cheaper. Another way to whip inflation now, as former President Gerald Ford used to say, is to institute a series of price freezes. That would be where the president of the United States declares an emergency 
He has the power to say it's against the law to increase prices. Now, if that seems like communism or, you know, fascism, it's what Richard Nixon did. I believe it was in 71. I'm not sure. Nixon just said you can't raise prices for anything. Uh, But that's the type of government intervention most Americans these days would find overly intrusive. Here's the best way to whip inflation. The best way to whip inflation is to use the antitrust laws already on the books and create the kind of competition that lowers prices. When only one company provides internet or cable service, they pretty much get away with charging whatever they want. Likewise, when a handful of companies manufacture all the wood, then coffins become more expensive. Did you know there's such a thing as big coffin? It's a monopoly that nobody likes to think about. Oil. They can charge whatever they want because they're only a handful of handful of oil companies. They should all be put out of business, but there's no competition. When there are more companies fighting for the same dollar, they lower their prices. You want to bring down inflation? Bust the monopolies wide open the way they used to. You break up big tech, big ag, the cost for everything will come down, even while wages go up. Wages will go up because these new companies, you know, you bust up a company, then new companies spring up. They're going to scramble to hire fresh talent. They're going to have to lure fresh talent with higher wages. It's a win-win for everybody but the five wealthiest families in this country who own Washington and every single business school and university that teaches economics. They keep Americans dumb when it comes to economics. So we keep electing stupid politicians like Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump. As long as we keep electing stupid politicians who make us dumber, we will never understand basic economics and we will fall prey to the liars who continue to say lowering taxes for the wealthy pays for itself. It doesn't. We will continue to believe that lowering taxes for the wealthy increases jobs. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how many times we've proven that supply side economics doesn't work. The rich want us to believe that. You know why? Because they don't want to pay taxes. So they will lie and cheat and pay people, pay economists and politicians to say anything, convince you and me of anything just so they don't have to pay taxes. And in order to pull this off, you and I, have to be economically illiterate. We have to be stupid. We can't understand basic economics 101. We have to believe the lie that lowering taxes for the wealthy pays for itself. Well, look at the budget deficit, right? Seven trillion, it's, it's $32 trillion, seven trillion of that belongs to Donald Trump because of the Trump tax cuts. The rest comes from George W. Bush because of his tax cuts and Ronald Reagan because of his tax cuts. If the American people continue to be this dumb, every lie can be repeated over and over until we believe it. It's how we got into Iraq and it's how we're getting into an economic downturn of income inequality that is going to be insurmountable until the American people wake up and understand that whatever comes out of the mouths of rich people is a lie. Think of your boss when you ask for a raise. He or she will say anything, do anything, except give you the raise that you deserve. He will, he will claim poverty. He will say next year, people who have money 
are liars. Everything taught at Harvard when it comes to economics is a lie because they have an endowment of $100 billion. They're controlled by rich people and rich people are effing liars. Don't trust them with your job, your life or your family. It's time for Thank God It's Dr. Fraud, our weekly segment. And uh, you seem very, uh, in a, you're in a good mood and you think all is well with the world. You, I, no. I mean, no. the United States is going down fast and the debt ceiling conversation is plummeting us further. I mean, already, if everyone knows, I mean, the Pew Charitable Trust at a study, 77% of the country thinks that we're going in the wrong direction. We don't have an alternative organization or party that promises the right direction of all the protest groups together, but they know we're going down. And this discussion about the debt ceiling is so tone deaf and insular. You know, in the year 2000, 90% of the Treasury savings in every country, the treasury holdings were in dollars. It's cut to 45% already. The idea that we could default, why hold American dollars? Why use the petrodollars? That's why the Saudis who used to be cozying up all the way up our ass are now, no, no more petrodollars. You deal in your own currency or the renminbi or the Chinese yuan. Wow. And so also the spectacle of cutting programs or making people pay while the rich still have a 50% off business uh, tab, 50% off their prices for their fancy restaurants and everything else is a business expense. And people have to pay for their fucking food stamps by... uh, working on some crap job that makes someone else rich. This is bizarre. I think what they're doing is that, as I recall, on June 17th, Trump's big tax cut for the rich is over and they want to renew it. And it's hard to renew it if we're in a big deficit crunch. And so they want to be able to shift money up as if there isn't enough of a discrepancy between wealth and poverty in this country and always increasing. And they want to shift it more. They want to keep it up. Or what they could do is the social security tax on incomes to feed into the social security stops at 160,000. What? Salaries go up to 42 million, 200 million. What about that? And they could certainly do that. They could also tax incomes over a million dollars. They could also go after the rich. They could also go after the gold they're holding, the paintings they're buying, and all the other ways of transferring money. They could change the inheritance tax from the $25 million a couple that can leave to their children without any taxes to what it was, I believe, in the 1980s, 600,000 for the couple. Well, that's the difference. There's been this wild shift to the top. And what happened, in my opinion, is that when the huge corporations realized with their fax machines and their fast jet travel and their computers that they could run their businesses in China, India, Bangladesh, where they could pay people under $3 an hour with no benefits, and no ecological considerations, they brought their million dollars back here and bought the political system to have the best democracy money can buy. And people feel excluded. And that's because they are, you know. It's not like France, Germany, or the Scandinavian countries where it's a crime to have private money in public elections. And so this is a travesty. This discussion about the debt ceiling is a travesty because it eliminates 
the elephant in the room, which is the GOP tax cut for billionaires. And since they all want the billionaires' approval to fund their campaigns, and since the last presidential campaign cost $4.4 billion, they're cozying up at all of our expense. And I think that's why a smaller percentage of Americans vote than do than the Scandinavians or the French or the Germans, because it's fixed. It, you know, it's a travesty. And nothing is more pathetic than the decisions they're making between taxing programs or making them harder for people or a deficit which will make the United States plummet internationally even faster than we are already. You know, it's pathetic. All these countries are online to join BRICS. The Brazil, Russia, India, China coalition as well, countries including Argentina, Nicaragua, they already got Brazil, that would be most of South America. And our country is going down. And I think it's going down in, because the choices that we're given ignore the elephant in the room. And it just incenses me to hear even on NPR or anywhere else, or to hear that one in four kids in New York City goes hungry, while over 100 billion goes to Zelensky, who has his beautiful, beautiful mansion on the Italian coast waiting for when he takes all that he can sell, which is a lot the Americans can give him, and moves and retires to his Italian mansion. This is, if people had choices, they wouldn't choose that. And I think that's why they are going mad and they're killing people and they're committing suicide and they're alienated from this pathetic, corrupt political process that has Supreme Court judges on the take, that has Santos sitting in the Congress as an emblem of the fact that our country is going down. And so that rant is over. Well, is there an, an inevitability to everything? Give me an economics lesson, because San Francisco outlaws self-driving cars, but Google says, no, no, the state says we can do it. So we now have self-driving cars in, in San Francisco and they're crashing and they're dangerous. And we're told, but it's inevitable. We have to have self-driving cars. If we don't have self-driving cars, the Chinese will beat us to it. Is there an, an inevitability to the economy or can the community decide this is what we value. This is what we don't value. We have a pool of money. We're going to spend it on this, but not that because we value this over that. Is that how the economy works? It can be if people are in the streets saying no or if people are organized into a party or a movement that doesn't tolerate the priorities that we have now. We don't have that in the United States. We have an incipient version of people understanding that there's two classes here, the employee class and the employer class. And people are organizing the way they haven't since the 30s because they're recognizing that and they're getting shafted. But there isn't a political voice and there has to be but i of course people can change it they've changed everything but they have to be organized and they have to be willing to stand up because they have a sense of what they're fighting for rather than just despair and that's what we need in the united states they have it in france which is how they got four million people in the streets I, I, I had a, a, a really almost apocalyptic vision of New York City last week. I was visiting a friend and he said, come up. I'm working in one of these high rises, these these office buildings. Come in and see how empty it is. And I went to visit him for coffee and these high rise buildings in Midtown are completely empty. And as I'm walking to visit him, I'm looking around, I'm thinking, 
This is all a lie. This whole thing is a lie. And the job that my friend has is a lie. And it's in, he's got this big office. He's, uh, you know, the, the floor is just empty offices, people walking around uh, like zombies. And and I hearken to something you said. We these are people who contribute nothing to society. That's right. They push paper. They look like they're contributing. They smell like they're contributing. And and then the the person we trust with our babies gets no money. That's right. And, and, or the people that wipe the, peop, the people the people that are going to wipe me in about three years. <laughs> Not that I'm old. It's just a kink. I know. But the, the, the real value, the, 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 the people who do real work. That's get right. paid the least. That's right. And all those migrants who he wants to have sleep in tents on the beach, far away from everything, or high school or gyms that have no shower. Uh, I mean, not gyms, auditoriums or wherever else. Hey, they can move into all those hotels that are empty. Right. And all those office buildings that have bathrooms and comforts. It's a disgraceful misallocation, as is the $840 billion not counting the CIA and all that other, uh, and the military, which has lost the last four wars. And it's just, as one of your people says, it's a slush fund. The, they keep pushing things like the war, the proxy war for America in Ukraine, so that they can make the $10 billion they're making out of this with military hardware. This is, you know, everything is a mess. And people have to take the matter in hand because they have to have an organization that says, we are the people, we are the voice, we know our priorities, you're not our priority. Right. I think there are three kind of jobs, Dr. Fraud. I think there are jobs that, as David Graeber, the late David Graeber said, bullshit jobs. Jobs that are just bullshit, where mm -hmm. you're totally... You're a supernumerary. They could live without you. You're just on the payroll. Then there are the bullshit jobs where the only real work you do is getting people killed, either working for a health insurance company or uh, the military industrial complex or Fox News. A bullshit job that's lethal. And then the third job is the real job. A nurse, a teacher, a truck driver, a plumber, an electrician, uh, a home health care aide. We have to teach the American people there has to be a cultural revolution where we start defining jobs as bullshit, lethal bullshit or real. That's right. But the biggest employers in the United States are bizarre and they don't fit real at all. They're Walmart, they're call centers, they're Amazon, and they're fast food. And people are part of the arm of a robot. As right. I said before, you have two minutes and 33 seconds to make that burger, put it in the hand, get people out of the door, or get dinged on your clicker. Right. And these are all bullshit jobs. They're all bullshit jobs. But we're, all corporate jobs. We have some questions from our virtual studio audience. We have an audience from around the world. Ian, who is, I believe, in Australia. Hi, Ian. Hi. He, Ian asks, does Dr. Harriet Fraud think that increasing poverty will result in the union movement regaining relevance and strength? I think that increasing poverty will cause misery. And that what has happened with the union movement is it's occurred to people after they were told they are essential and then they're cheated out of their wages. Wait a minute. If I'm so essential, I have to be paid. And they realize I'm doing the work. They're making the profit. I get shafted. And even though they've done very well, I haven't. I have to get in on this. And so they're fighting. 
and they're fighting all over the place, places that didn't used to have unions like museums or writers or, you know, whatever. It's not just blue collar, you know, university workers. People are realizing, wait a minute, we're the working class. We're the people who do the work. We need to be rewarded, not just work to make someone else even richer, the hospital administrator even richer while the nurse has a bigger and bigger caseload and can't take care of her patients. People are understanding that. But what they don't have is a political voice to take it to the street, to take it out, to talk to people, to have a program and to unite all the concerns, climate, sexual choice, Black Lives Matter feminism, all of those things together. Together. We're talking with Dr. Harriet Fraud. She's a psychotherapist who treats people through the prism of the economic system uh, that has its jackboot on our throat. So together in childhood development, would we encourage our children to be hyper individualistic? Would you teach a child? You you would not in in, in a kindergarten. You don't teach them that, actually, because you wouldn't have a classroom otherwise. You can't hit. You can't take the kids, take the public tricycles and charge the kids if they want to use it for 10 minutes. No, you teach sharing. You teach caring because otherwise people would be fighting and biting each other all the time. So what you do is you teach a kind of civilized behavior that's contradicted. So at the playground, kids share. You know, one kid has a a little plastic pail and shovel. The other kid has a truck and they're cooperating, putting the sand in the truck and then emptying the sand. And the kid with the truck says, I'll give you my truck. And the mother says, are you kidding? That was $17 and all you're getting is that crappy plastic bucket? Oh, no, you know, you know, there's lots of contradictions. But kids are taught to share. Otherwise, they wouldn't get through kindergarten. So the Republicans, the fascists, let's call them what they are. Yes. They're trying to change our schools. They think it's a hotbed of leftist thought because they're trying to because our teachers are still trying to raise healthy kids who are, want to be part of the community. That's right. Very terrifying. Also, I uh, want to teach the truth of what happened in America, which isn't rosy. We've been, we're a, a settler colonialism. Native Americans are still the poorest Americans with the most COVID. And we killed 55 million of them. And, you know, black people were brought here as slaves, although they call it black immigration in some of these states. Um, there is a whole... Denial. I think they're denial, denying the empire is falling. They're denying what we've been through. You know, I went to Germany maybe 10 years ago. They were still dealing with how did we let fascism happen in the big history museum? How did it happen? Why did it happen? We've never done that for slavery mm-hmm. or the genocide of the Native American populations. And some people want us to now, okay. This is where we are. This is where we are as an ending empire. This is where we've been. And other people are in denial. They want to pretend that they can make America the king again. But every other economy hasn't been destroyed by World War II. It's not going to be so easy now. China, which was one of the poorest countries in the world, had their revolution in 1949. And now they have, talking about competing with China, They have 12 high-speed rail lines zipping across China. We have none, not one. They lifted 880 million people out of extreme poverty. We're driving people into poverty. There is a huge discrepancy of which we are in denial. And that's, you know, we have to face it. Okay, empires rise and fall. We can save the 840 billion or close to that much and make this place a kind and productive and interesting nation. Henry Huckamacki, who used to do this show all the time, introduced me to you, said that 
capitalists love to say no other economic system has lifted as many people out of poverty in the 20th century. And he said, take China out of the equation and capitalism. I'm sorry. And Russia, for all its faults, you know, you could sell a woman at the time of the revolution. No, he what he is saying is that capitalists, if they don't use China in their statistics, if you take China out of that, capitalism has not lifted anybody out of poverty and China is not a capitalist country. So it's it's partly capitalist. It's an amalgam of state capitalism and capitalism carefully uh, regulated. But also you'd have to take out all the people who died of starvation and you'd have to take out all the people in the United States now who die of diseases that aren't covered and all the black maternal deaths, which is so much higher than they are in poor little Cuba and all the other deaths where people don't afford their medication and so on. We are a country that is going down. Right. Every year, people die earlier in the United States. Right. That is an indication. We also get shorter. We used to be the tallest people in the world. Now it's the Dutch and it's Scandinavian. But we're getting fatter, but we're not yeah. gaining in height. We're gaining in width. Yeah, because we're eating crap food. You know, we're sitting in front of our TVs trying to get nutrition from a huge bag of Doritos, which is equal to a half a cup of lentils in actual nutrition, and well, we, eating more and more and more. That's, that's the American work. That's the American work ethic, trying to get nutrition out of bag after bag of Pringles. Uh, Rich asks what you think of Marion Williamson's campaign for president. I think it's a very sweet idea, and I think she has wonderful humane values, but she's not exactly explicitly taking on capitalism, which I think she would need to do. However, what she says is very sweet and very nice and a whole lot nicer than the Republicans or the Democrats. But are you throwing your vote away by voting for her as opposed to Biden? I don't know. I, I it's Look, I saw a cartoon in the Daily News by Bram Hall, and it was an introduction, you know, people were coming for a presidential debate. Biden was being wheeled in on a wheelchair, looking mighty fragile, whereas Trump is strapped in a straitjacket onto a, a dolly being wheeled in while being strapped in. Wow, these are our presidential candidates. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you're throwing your vote away or what it would say. Are, but I th- are, it, Trump is certifiably insane, correct? Insane and fascist. And Joe Biden uh, is declining. Is that fair to say? Yes, declining. And he's never been a radical voice, exactly. But I'm talking about his mind. We have a his cra- mind seems to be probably as good as it ever was, which isn't saying much. However, he's not as bad as Trump. That's why he's preferable. He's not as bad as Trump. When people say, is this the best America has to offer? Are they the two chief contenders because they're both addled? Is that why they've risen to the top? No, I think they've risen to the top, A, because there is no popular voice that puts forward a candidate that has a current challenging analysis to the status quo. Neither of them do. Trump fulminates and captures people's rage at their denial. Biden has some nice ideas that he'll never get across or stand up for any more than he did for Anita Hill when he was on that all-male committee evaluating her and not talking to any of the other 25 women who testified against Clarence Thomas. There is no real opposition. Right. And... Trump looks good to people because he's fulminating, he's opposing, he's passionate. Is it fair to say this about Trump, that he earned every vote in the Republican Party, that the thumb was put on the scale for Biden in 2020 by Obama and the back rooms and the smoke filled rooms? 
But Donald Trump, for the first time in his life, actually, when when he got the nomination, there there was nobody in the back room putting the thumb on this or was there because it just it feels like the establishment didn't want Trump. And he he actually, for the first time in his life, earned that nomination. Is that a fair statement? In part, he did. But big money didn't care. They were going to keep being the dominating force of the society, no matter what. Right. OK. So that, OK. Trump is obviously nuts. But OK. I mean, I don't I don't think he really earned that. But I think he did capture people's rage. Right. And their sense of being denied, which are true. Arthur asks, do you think Trump will ever be held accountable? Let me before you. This is Tom and Jerry and the Roadrunner. The, it, you don't. It, the show's over if he gets caught. Do, do you think right. he do you think he's I think that Gene Carroll start, you know, first Stormy Daniels had the guts to bring Trump up, even though her child was threatened, she was threatened and so on. And I think E. Jean Carroll is next. And she has shown Trump that he had to literally pay. And now she has a new $10 million lawsuit for his continued defamation. And I think it is catching up with him and he will have to pay. I don't know if he'll ever go into the big house, but it's possible because he has five more cases and he's lost two. That doesn't look good. And so I think he might be found guilty all the way around. And you do see him going to jail. I do see him going to jail, depending on the Republicans will never do that because he, he's more popular than any of the others. So they want his votes. So they'll, you know, no one insults him. Right. Finally, finally, this is a great question. Bruce asks. How about if we all join the Repugs, the Republicans, and then we could all vote in the primaries? Could this work to get the best of the worst as candidates? Or is there more of an opportunity for real progressives in the Republican Party? I mean, the Republican Party, you know, during the time of Teddy Roosevelt, who was a racist and uh, committed genocide, but... You know, he was a trust buster. Would would the left do better trying to tap into the populist energies within the Republican Party? I don't think so, because they're so racist. Those populists. But weren't the original populists racist? I don't know. I mean, they were anti-immigrant. I, I, I'm pretty sure that at the turn of the 20th. However, however, the, you know, the other great figure. Trump is not a great figure, but the, there was a great figure who ran from jail. The socialist, of course. And he did quite well. Debs. But he stood for something. Eugene Debs. Stands, uh, yes, Eugene Debs. Trump stands against. And I don't think, I think that if it wouldn't be a good idea to join the Republican Party because it's so imbued with misogyny and racism that we would not be heard. And they're also very violent. So I don't think we'd stand a chance. But if the progressives got together, the progressive caucus and everyone else who's progressive and started the People's Party or whatever they wanted to call it, the United Party, that would be a very important thing to do. Very the Democratic important. Party, when it was at its most powerful, was imbued with the KKK and Southern racists. And we were, we were getting things done. I don't know. Yeah, except that at its most powerful and most beloved was with FDR, who did fight against racism and empowered people. And but but he, he was beholden to Southern Democrats who were the worst of the worst. He was slightly beholden, but he taxed the rich at 96.8 percent because he could say to them, there's people in the street. You corporations won't have a corporation unless you give in to this. And he could say it to everyone. And he, because the people were rising, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, they were powerful. 
There were two socialist parties and a communist party, and they were scared. And Roosevelt moved because he could he could tell them, you better go this direction or you won't, you know, you will you'll be without your holdings. We don't have that kind of movement. If we did, we could push our country to a progressive direction. Dr. Harriet Fraud, Dr. Harriet Fraud is the host of Capitalism Hits Home, as well as it's not just in your head. You can hear her here in New York City on WBAI Pacifica Radio on Tuesday nights. I believe it's 630. Who do you at 630 interpersonal update? And who does who does uh, Capitalism Hits Home with you? Democracy at Work. Does capitalism hits home? And it's not just in your head, which is about, you know, your problems are not just in your head. Like if you're evicted, it's not just you made bad choices. You're psychologically damaged. Right. It's the landlord. Um, and that that's a program. It's not just in your head is a podcast that I do with Liam Tate and Ikoi Hero. Fantastic. We love you, Dr. Fraud. And. Thank you for your generosity. Yes, I was chafing at the bit. Yes. But you're welcome. And thank you. And it's the Reverend Barry W. Lynn's fault, not mine. I'll go after him. In the <laughs> <laughs> it takes a little man to blame somebody else. Thank you, Dr. Harriet Fraud. Bye. Bye bye. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self actualized hump. 